welcome Carenza. <coughs> Thank you very much everybody and thank you very much for inviting me up here um, to share in your launch of what is obviously going to be a fantastic project. Um, what I'm here to talk about tonight is um, an aspect of uh, what I'm, uh, I'm afraid slightly embarrassed to be calling the wreath big dig when I realised I should have titled this the Swaledale big dig. I did offer to change it when I arrived here this evening and I said no it's fine it doesn't matter. Um, but. Um, this, Alan's going to talk a little bit more about the general and um, what's going to be going on. It's a, it's a three phase project over two years, as you've already heard. Um, 2014 is the initial documentary research, field walking landscapes, scape surveying, and geophysics. <coughs> um, and then phase two, 2014 into 2015, um, the excavation of the test pits in Reef and possibly other surrounding areas. I think the test pitting is just focusing on Reef for the time being. And then phase three will be writing up and disseminating the results to everybody. Now, this question has come up already, and I was very grateful to Rob for prefiguring uh, exactly uh, the, uh, what I knew was going to be in this. You might well be asking why. So what I want to talk about tonight is why test pitting in these historic settlements is such a useful and fantastic and enjoyable thing to do and what might be discovered here in Reef and indeed in Fremington and Grinton as well. Though, again, I don't think the test meeting is going that far yet. Though as you'll see, I hope, by the time I finish talking, you'll be starting to think about where to go next as well. So um, the I have been involved in um, uh, an extended program of test pitting in historic settlements um, focusing in eastern England. We, do, we work in what we call currently occupied rural settlements. They're the opposite of deserted medieval villages, the DMVs. They're the places that people are still living in today, Reef being an obvious example. And the aim of the test pitting initially, when I started doing this, was simply to find out more about how these places developed in the past, because as Robert so eloquently already pointed out, we know so very little about these sorts of places, and particularly about villages and hamlets that are still lived in today, because you can't look at them from air and make very much sense of them. You can't see your dike system or your barrows or whatever um, <coughs> scattered across the landscape. You can't see that your uh, dikes are cutting through ridge and furrow or the other way around. Um, you can't see anything apart from the existing settlement over it. Uh, these are places that don't tend to get built on, um, so there's no opportunity to dig in advance of the latest uh, supermarket coming in. Um, so they tend to be ironically, the black holes in the landscape in, ter in terms of what we know about their past development. Um, the term <coughs> currently occupied rural settlement makes no assumptions about how long those settlements have been in existence for or how continuous those settlements might have been. Some people call uh, today's villages and hamlets and small towns continuing settlements. That rather implies the settlement has been continuous all the time, and this isn't necessarily the case. And as I said, they're very different. They're the opposite, if you like, of deserted medieval villages. Um, it's making the point that a DMV is deserted, possibly medieval, and sometimes a village, but always deserted. We currently occupy rural settlements. We don't know what date they are. We know they're in existence now. We have a reasonably good idea of their development over the last couple of hundred years, as we've already seen. Tithe maps, early uh, ordnance survey maps give us good information about the layout of the settlements, but only for the last couple of hundred years. Our excavations have mainly focused in eastern England. Um, so this is a map of the sort of bottom two thirds of England, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, that's Leeds up there, so I'm afraid to get a decent scale in here. I couldn't quite get a uh, wreath onto this map, though it will show up a bit later. Um, but these uh, blue balloons are villages that we've carried out this test fitting in. I have to say, when I say we, I am employing this in the same way the Queen does, to mean mostly somebody else. Um, as mostly I have been rushing around making sure all the test bits are being done properly, but mostly by other people. We've probably had <coughs> around 10,000 people have been involved in the digging of the pits over 10 years. We started this in 2005. 
Um, so there's a lot of this been going on, mostly in the six East Anglian counties of Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, Essex, Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire, though we do have a few outliers, as you can see, and I'm going to talk about a couple of those a little bit later. Eastern England is very different to up here, and I'm always, uh, I am not privileged to live and work up here, as um, Keith uh, so clearly said he was, uh, and every time I come up to this part of the world, I'm very envious of those of you who are. Uh, Eastern England is lovely in many respects. It doesn't have quite the soaring grandeur of the landscape, but it is uh, very nice in areas. It's rolling lowland countryside, um, uh, quite dominated by water, and it's got a long coastline. The east of England does have quite a lot of um, contrast, which makes it interesting to work in, although it doesn't have dramatic landscape differences in topography moving from, going from coastline to the tops of the dales. Um, it does have um, considerable variation in population. This is the Doomsday Book population, so it has some of the most densely populated areas and some of the least densely populated areas. And it also has a great variety of settlement forms. So unlike, unlike much of southern Eng central England, which is dominated by nucleated villages, uh, eastern England is much more varied in its settlement form. And I'm not going to give you a lecture on settlement types at this point, but it's just really to make the point. There's a lot of diversity. And again, Rob has mentioned this question, why are settlements different? You can look at you know, an area where you've got lots of settlements that are close together, and they can be very different in form. They're, they've got to be like that for a reason. We don't usually understand what those reasons are. We've excavated more than 1,500 test pits over the, um, well, this will be our 10th year. And this is a map of Eastern England showing the locations of all those communities where we've done those test pit excavations. Each of these black dots is um, one village hamlet, uh, one parish, essentially, um, where we've um, been doing some excavation. And there are numbers increasing all the time. We're going to be in Southworld, which is just next to Warberswick in the summer uh, again. For example, now the methods are very simple. I'm just going to show you a few pictures of what these test bits look like because I do hope that as many of you as possible will get involved in the digging, particularly if you live in reef and have any space in your garden. Um, the idea is that within one settlement, you get as many test bits dug as possible. And it's a bit like a pixelated uh, screen image. The more test pits you get dug, the more clearly you can see the picture. Or to use another um, analogy, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Every test pit you get done enables you to know what's going on in that place. They're very small. They're just a metre square. They usually take a day, a couple of days to get dug. It can be dug with a neatness and precision, uh, which leaves virtually no trace afterwards. Um, it's based on the, um, the, the, this method came to fame for the first time on the telly in 2003 on Time Team's Big Dig, um, when people across the country, I think about 1,300 test pits got done, well, got started anyway, um, over, those, <laughs> over those sort of nine days. Um, they didn't all get finished. Um, it was a great way of getting people involved in archaeology, but there wasn't really probably sufficient follow-up to... Um, make sure that they all got finished. And that's one of the really vital things. It's very easy to get started with a great burst of enthusiasm, and get down about 25 centimetres, by which time you've discovered there's a lot more like hard work than you'd initially assumed. Um, this is particularly young men in their 30s are inclined to think this is going to be very straightforward and they get the whole thing done by the time they get to the pub. Uh, at lunchtime and discover that it's slightly harder work than that, at which point um, you lose heart, decide you probably haven't got anything coming up anyway, you've got through the Victorian layers, you haven't got much coming up, so you give it up as a bad job and go to the pub. Um, uh, this was where this was Channel 4 series, of course, Time Team. At the time, Brookside, which was the Channel 4 soap opera, was running a story about a body buried under the patio, so there was considerable speculation as to what might turn up there. Um, it's that same method that also you've seen in Michael Wood's TV series, The Story of England and the Great British Story as well. Um, the method we used, which is the same one used in um, The Story of England, the Great British Story digging, which we managed the test bit digging for them, <coughs> is to go down in 10 centimetre layers. You do a plan of each layer before you dig it, just a quick sketch plan at 1 to 10. We have pro forma uh, booklets that all the records are made in so that you won't miss anything out. And you know if you've filled in all the boxes, um, you've done the recording you need to. 10 centimetres at a time. 
uh, all the spoil is sieved through a standard um, 10 millimeter mesh. That's your standard sort of garden, you know, the sort of sieve you can buy from any garden center. Um, to check for fines, and the fines from each of those 10 centimetre layers are kept separate. So you can see if you're going through layers of different dates as you go further down. Um, you need to have experts on site to tell people what's turning up. It's the, as you get into earlier layers, the stuff you'll find becomes less easy to recognise. It's relatively easy to spot a bit of 20th century pottery, much more difficult to spot a bit of 10th century pottery. Um, what might you find? Well, um, we sometimes get really nice bits and pieces coming up. There's a Neolithic scraper here made out of flint. All of these turned up in test pits. Um, a glass eye. Uh, I've had a lot of those, but you'd be surprised. <laughs> this was actually a human-sized glass eye. Uh, some speculation that actually a guy who lived in the village and kept coming to visit the digs might have lost it because he did only have one eye. Um, and then somebody pointed out the one he did have was blue, so it probably wasn't his. Um, uh, modern sort of jewellery, old bits and pieces. This is a medieval arrowhead. This is a pewter mirror case. It's actually an uh, image of the crucifixion there, though you'd be forgiven for not spotting that. Um, an iron knife. So you sometimes get these sorts of bits and pieces, but actually, the stuff that's really, really interesting, which I will be most interested to hear about what you find from Reef, isn't these relatively exceptional finds, it's this sort of stuff. And you can see from that how easy this could be to spot, especially if you don't recognise it when you first see it, and you haven't got someone there to say, ah, this is medieval sandy ware, this is dating to 1200 AD, uh, this is 800 years old, this is exactly what we're looking for. Now, the reason this is so valuable it's very obvious when you think about it. Could you put your hand up, please, if you have ever dropped and broken a pottery bowl or plate or cup or mug? <laughs> ever. <laughs> right, so that would be everyone, I suspect. And some of you may have dropped and broken more than one. Um, now, could you put your hand up if every single pottery plate or bowl or cup or mug or anything you've ever broken was carefully glued back together and is still being used today? <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> Everyone else in this room, you have already left yourself a passport to immortality. You've already left an archaeological record of your existence for the future in that broken pottery. And that's why pottery is so valuable, because... In the medieval period, and in fact from the Neolithic period onwards, on and off in this part of the world, pottery is widely used. It's easily broken. If you drop it, it doesn't bounce, it doesn't dent, it breaks. When it is broken, it's pretty impossible to mend. We occasionally come across bits of Roman Samian ware that have been sort of welded back together with a lead solder joint. It doesn't work very well, but in a prized heirloom, you do what you can. Uh, but otherwise, it's cheap, so it gets thrown away. When it does get thrown away, it doesn't rot. If you drop a wooden bowl <coughs> and it breaks and you throw it away, that wood will rot. If you drop a metal bowl, you can melt it down and make it with something else, and in any case, it'll probably just get a dent. But the pottery, those fragments of pottery, are durable. And the other thing about pottery is it looks different from different periods of time. If you find a sheep <coughs> bone, a sheep bone from the Roman period looks pretty damn similar to a sheep bone from about 10 years ago, well, certainly from 100 years ago. Um, you can't date them just by looking at them. Pottery, you can do. So what we can then do with the pottery is look much more widely than those uh, arrowheads or those bits of sparkly jewellery, uh, which are just one-offs, because pottery is part of a bigger picture. And that's what's going to be really exciting about the results from Reef, is seeing what the bigger picture is. So what I'm going to do now is just show you some slides of some of the other sites we've worked on so you can see how that bigger picture works. So this is from our website, um, it's uh, Access Cambridge Archaeology. If you Google that, it will take you to our website, which is hosted by the University of Cambridge. Um, and on the project reports page, if you click on that, you'll then go here and down listed by county are all the counties that we've worked in and you can simply click on any of those and have a look at the individual reports. So the first one I'm going to show you is Long Melford in Suffolk and this is because this is the one that we did in the Great British Story with Michael Wood uh, which was broadcast in 2012 as part of these sort of jubilee celebrations, well loosely speaking. 
Um, so this is in Suffolk, so you see this is, a, this is the website, you go to the project reports bit here, Suffolk it all comes out down there and there's all of these sites listed long, in alphabetical order, so scan down to Long Melford. So here's Long Melford, uh, it is very long, um, that's silly in those days, they don't make these names up for the sheer hell of it. Um, it is extremely long, in fact, if you look at the scale here, that's 0 to 1,400 metres. The village is getting on for three miles long. Uh, the church is right up at the northern end of it, and each of these white squares is the site of one of these one-metre square test bits. I should point out they're not shown to scale. <laughs> it would be very informative to have dug pits that would be about 150 metres square, but very time-consuming. And most people, even I think I would have qualms about having a 150 metre square test pit in my garden. And most people likewise. This was about 43, I think, pits we had across Long Melford. Um, what we can do from that is plot which pits produce material of different dates. So when we're looking, this is um, 1200 to 800 BC, so we're looking at the Bronze Age here, and there's just one tiny little piece. So the way evidence is shown here is if a pit didn't produce any information of that date, it's white. If it did, it's as a circle, uh, and the bigger the circle, the more pottery. Uh, the grey circles have come from layers where it's mixed in with later materials, so maybe disturbed. The black ones have come from undisturbed levels. So this is a bit of Bronze Age pottery. This is actually quite shallow. It was only about 20, 30 centimetres down. So we can go forward in time. The next period for which we have any information is the 1st to 5th century AD, commonly known as the Roman period. And as you can see, there's masses of Roman pottery turning up in Long Melford, but very much all in the southern end of the present village, very little up in the north end of the village at all. So we can get a feel for where the Roman settlement was. Going forward in time, the next period for which we have any information at all is the late Anglo-Saxon period, about 850 to 10, well, 1066, if one's going to be sort of accurate, but really it's the sort of midnight to the mid-11th century. Um, there's nothing from the early or middle Anglo-Saxon period. That Roman settlement completely disappears. Or if there's any continuation of it, it's very, very small, and they're using very little pottery. And in eastern, eastern England, we do get continuous pottery sequences right through the, the Anglo-Saxon period. So we do know it's being used, but there's clearly not much going on in Long Melford. When it emerges in the late Anglo-Saxon period, we can see that instead of the big settlement that there was in the Roman period, we've got two small cores of settlement, one just here, and one just here. Now this is where there was Roman settlement. This is new, and this is up by the church. This is very close to the church at Long Melford, which is one of those fantastically uh, big Suffolk churches built effectively um, with wool. Not literally built of wool, but built with wool money. Uh, so the wool trade was very profitable as, of course, um, as is much of Yorkshire indeed. Into the high medieval period, the period between loosely the Norman conquest and the Black Death sort of the middle 11th century to 1350 or so. This settlement here, this Anglo-Saxon settlement here, has grown and expanded a bit. It's perhaps extended down here. Um, and the high medieval settlement is extending up here as well. Going forward in time into the late medieval period, so from 1350 to 1550, you can see this, this area of the town is clearly consolidating. All the gaps in it, if you look at the earlier period, it's quite gappy there. Very solid, compact, nucleated, small town, effectively, with much less going up, going on around the church. All of this town is the best part of getting on for, well, certainly well over half a mile from the church. And then we can see how the town grows into the post-medieval period, uh, with the area around the church enlarging, uh, the town here growing. And into the Victorian period, nearly all of the pits are producing pottery, as we'd expect, because they're nearly all in people's back gardens. And these are houses that we know have mostly been in existence in the Victorian period, because we see that on the maps. So that's Long Melford. And you might think that was a fairly typical steady growth. Roman origins, bit of a disaster afterwards. Late Saxon foundation grows fairly steadily thereafter. But actually, that's not the case. I'm going to show you now Purton in Hertfordshire, um, this village has had 104, I think they're now up to 110 actually, test pits dug. This was somewhere we initially started working in with school group. We did five test pits the first year. 
Perton then discovered, the coordinators in Perton then discovered there were other villages who'd had more pits dug than they had, <laughs> mainly because of other villages who'd been at it by two, for two or three years by then. Uh, instead of deciding, well, that was fine, it, it didn't matter, they were like, nobody's beating us. So they got themselves mobilised. So nearly all of those 104 pits, actually a good 80 of them, have been dug by people who live in and around the village. They drafted in the local archaeological society, you know, they, they, they got themselves mobilised. As you can see, it's nice, um, it's again, it's on our, our website, this is what you'd see if you went to that page, so a nice shot of the village, Lowland Village. Here is Purton again, that same notation, the white squares, the test bits that haven't produced pottery of any given date. And you can see how widely across the village we've got the test pits uh, spread, uh, including in this area where there's only a few farms now, this is where most of the village is now. The church is there, and there's a Mott and Bailey Castle here, the Mott is there, and Bailey areas all around here. This is why we have a gap there because this area is all scheduled and we can't dig in it. And the, ironically, we now know less about the areas that are scheduled than about all of the rest of the village. Um, I, every now and again, I have a sort of word with English heritage, but they make a quite reasonable point that we might not know about it, but it isn't going anywhere, so we might as well leave it intact. Um, again, here we can see Neolithic pottery, just one fragment turning up here into the Bronze Age. A little bit more of a scatter, but nothing sort of terribly massive, but a bit of background noise tells us the place isn't a desert landscape. Into the Iron Age, again, it's not a great technique really for the prehistoric period because you don't find enough pottery in the prehistoric period to be able to date it very well. Flint isn't very accurately datable, but into the Roman period, of course, it works much better. And here's Perton in the Roman period. Interesting, we can see we've got masses of Roman pottery up here along the stream valley. This is not a wild topographic variation here. Um, but you can see you've got the Roman settlement very much in the area where the existing settlement isn't. And there's clearly something going on around here as well. Into the middle early Anglo-Saxon period, just like Long Melford, that Roman settlement disappears. To make the point that pottery is being used, there is one small shirt of it come from there. There's clearly something still going on there, but as you can see again, massive change in that period. Into the late Anglo-Saxon period, very different to Long Melford. Perton is much smaller than Long Melford today, but in the late Anglo-Saxon period, it's clearly very significant. There's masses coming from here, there's masses around here. We can see that the existing settlement today is clearly founded in the late Anglo-Saxon period with perhaps a bit of outline, a few outlying farmsteads perhaps on the edge of the village here. Going forward into the high medieval period, look at that. Perton is clearly absolutely thriving, probably stimulated by the investment that the Lord is putting in to uh, probably relocating the church, as the church was discovered in advance of development somewhere around here with a cemetery. So I think in the 12th century the church has moved here, this part of the village comes into existence Huge amounts of material um, here. Every test pit producing masses and masses of pottery. Perton is clearly well suited, uh, well sorted, really. Why, you think, is it not a major town that I haven't heard of now? And the reason is probably this, because that is the post-Black Death Village. Um. And you can see the impact of that. Long Melford, where we saw it growing in the late medieval period, is an aberration. When we look regionally across the eastern region, it's very unusual. Perton is an extreme example of contraction, but you can see the impact. It's not that just the Black Death, there's a whole succession of cumulative setbacks, really, of which the Black Death is the sort of final nail in the coffin for many settlements that never really recovered thereafter, but might have staggered on. Perton is clearly doing the staggering on thing here. There's a little bit going on there, but very little. Look at this, all of this area completely depopulated, the whole of that street, <coughs> virtually nothing going on around here all of this area as well. Into the post-medieval period, we see recovery eventually starting to kick back in. But even this, it's not up to the standards of the high medieval peak. It doesn't recover to that level until we get really into the 19th century. This is post-industrial revolution when there's much more pottery in circulation anyway. So that's just a couple of examples. What I want to do now is just give you a bit of an idea about what you can, how you can scale out <coughs> even further and how this is going to be relevant to reef. What we've got, of course, now with all of these villages is information for each period about how many of the excavated pits have produced pottery of different dates. So I appreciate you can't see the detail of these, but these are listed in alphabetical order. 
What we can do now is for any settlement, we can see how it compares with regional averages. So this is Roman pottery. This is all of the villages where we've excavated 23 pits or more. 23 is a slightly random number. I would have gone for 25, I'd really rather go for 30. Um, but we had quite a few communities where we'd got 23 pits and it's a shame to miss them out. I really reckon you need a good 30 pits in a single community to really be able to look at change over time without the problem. If you've only got 10 test pits and two turn something up, it completely flips the data, your statistics. So you need slightly more to be able to make sense. So this is Roman pottery. And for this, this is the percentage of pits that have produced two or more sherds. I don't know if you're able to guess which place that is, but it is in fact Long Melford. And the scale up here again, I know it's difficult to see here, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. So Long Melford at about 49%, 49% of the excavated pits have produced a couple of sherds or Roman pottery or more. And in fact, most of the pits produce a lot more than that. But you can see Long Melford is very exceptional. Uh, the next closest rival is, I think that's Peacock in North Cambridge, which is on the Carl Dyke, which is a big Roman sort of... Uh, canal engineering trade, um, water trade route. But you can see how varied it is, and lots and lots of the villages are producing absolutely none. On average, and we can now start to average this across and then see how any other settlement benchmarks against that. So on average, 8% of pits produce two or more shirts of pottery. So for any individual settlement, you can now see whether it's above average or below average. And of course, for reef, you can then compare that to how it compares with the regional averages and if we could get some more <coughs> villages dug in northern England, it would be brilliant to see how northern England compared with eastern England to start to look at wide regional differences. So for Suffolk, for example, I had to do a talk in Suffolk recently, so I pulled the data together for this. Uh, the average is 10%. So Suffolk is pretty average when it comes to Roman pottery. For the late Anglo-Saxon period, this is the data. You can see that Long Melford, that's Long Melford, it was so... Um, so good in the Roman period drops right back in the late Anglo-Saxon period. Um, less variation generally, the, the highs and lows are less great. There are still some places that are producing nothing. On average, 10% of pits <coughs> produce two or more sherds of late Anglo-Saxon pottery. When we go into the high medieval period, you can see the jump. Here you can see how much higher the state figures are. 38% of pits on average will produce two or more sherds of high medieval pottery. And then we can see the impact of the Black Death. Because when we look at the late medieval period, we can see that drop. 21% of pits, barely half from 38%, nearly 40% to just over 20%, drops by almost half. We're actually able to measure the impact of the Black Death, one of those cumulative setbacks of the 14th century, from these tiny little bits of grotty pottery that people have dropped and thrown away in the past without ever thinking twice about, that you would probably, or most of you, would probably not notice digging the garden normally, but by looking at this information, we could actually measure the impact of that tumultuous century, 14th century. And then we can see how things change in the post-medieval period, mainly due to the um, sort of industrialization, improved communications. There's much more pottery in circulation. 59% of pits produce post-medieval pottery in eastern England. What we can then do, of course, um, is start to look at general patterns. So I apologise, this blue line slightly uh, faint, but you can see there's an average pattern of about 10% Roman drops right down in the early and middle Anglo-Saxon periods, about 2% on average, less than 2% grows in the late Anglo-Saxon period, soars into the high medieval, drops back in the late medieval, and then picks up again. Suffolk, as I said, I did this recently, Suffolk follows the standard trajectory but isn't as badly hit by the Black Death. Now, I don't know why people in Suffolk appear to be so robust, but what's interesting is you can see, although it's, they're not as badly hit, but the trajectory, they actually follow very much the same trajectory. Those two lines are exactly parallel in terms of the, the sort of post-medieval pickup. And I'm not going to talk about this for too long because I'm aware that I, I don't want to ever run too much. But what we can start doing, start doing then is start mapping this. Um, so we can look at the, this is the pits that are producing Anglo-Saxon pottery. Um, and you can see um, just at a glance, really, uh, the ones that are producing none are particularly in this area. This is Fenland. 
and particularly down in this area, this is essentially Essex um, and South Hertfordshire, there's clearly <coughs> something different going on in the Anglo-Saxon period down here and <coughs> around Fenland. And we can see, if you like, the, the Anglo-Saxon economic boom, perhaps, uh, very clearly indicated in this central, sort of most of Norfolk, central Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, and into Bedfordshire. And then we can start to compare it with other data, so we can overlay it on the, um, this is the Doomsday Book population. Again, I showed you that already, that's Fenland, very low populated, that's uh, eastern Norfolk and eastern Suffolk, very high populated, and these moderately high populated areas. And you can see how the correlation is good which shows that the method works. But it also gives a sort of added refinement, if you like, because we can go to anywhere and get this data just by getting the community involved in doing this digging. And you can see how all these settlements with no pottery are ones where the, the documented population statistics are very low. Uh, and of course, we don't have this. We do, we're very lucky with Doomsday Book, but there's nothing as good as Doomsday Book, really, till the early 14th century. We can compare these, uh, these highs and lows, the high medieval compared with the late medieval, and we can map that. So here's the villages where we've got 23 plus pits dug, and that is those villages shown at different sizes based on what percentage of pits produced uh, two or more sheds of pottery. So that's Perton, we've already seen, have very, very <coughs> densely potteried, if you like, potulated, perhaps it's not quite populated, but we're using pottery as a proxy for human activity. You can see how Perton's actually is really quite exceptional, certainly in terms of East Anglia, but there are others. Um, Long Melford are really not particularly in the high medieval period, but you can see there's a definite feeling of this <coughs> central East Anglia, the same area that had much more Anglo-Saxon pottery, is also got much higher levels in the high medieval period, that, that good early start, if you like, seems to be being reflected in growing population. And then we can look at the post-Black Death period, the post-14th century period, using that same notation, the bigger the circle, the higher the percentage of pits producing pottery. So we can actually then map that impact. And that's what we see. Look at that. That central area is absolutely decimated. Well, even more than decimated. Decimated is only taking out one in ten. You can see the impact it has, and of course we can map that as well. The only places really that aren't shrinking, Thorny, Long Melbourne, <coughs> to Nayland, and Cheddarston. Cheddarston's a bit peculiar because it has a late medieval pottery kiln in the village, and I think that might be skewing the data. <laughs> Nayland is a market village, it doesn't have much arable land at all, it may be uh, yeah, using commerce to keep going. Long Melford is another wool village, um, but it does have quite a lot of arable land. Thorny, we don't understand Thorny at all. Uh, it's, got, it's got a big abbey. People have suggested people move to Thorny after Black Death because the abbey might protect them, which sounds a reasonable theory until you look at Binham, which also has a very nice abbey, well, priory, um, which doesn't have that protection. But the point is that you can see how those tiny little sherds of pottery that have come out from one metre square excavations that have taken hours, literally, to dig in hundreds, thousands of gardens are creating this big picture, which is really overturning, well, changing our understanding of history and the historical development of the region in the past. And we can then, so this is just the same data, turned upside down. The bigger the circle, the bigger the, uh, the contraction. So bigger, big red circle is big red, you know, red traffic lights stop. These are the villages that are growing green. The more they grow, the bigger the circle. Um, and again, we can look at these sort of, this same area as the Anglo-Saxon period. And then we can sort of, play around with it any which way. This is the deserted settlements. I showed you that map of deserted medieval villages earlier. This is these in East Anglia. And we can see how actually our big red, our, our big stop traffic light, uh, really badly affected villages are in those same areas. It's always suspected, and indeed my suspicion was, that the deserted villages are the exceptions, they're the ones that have done particularly badly, they are smaller and poorer and later when you look at historical data, they're the kind of, you know, little weedy weaklings of the uh, settlement landscape, they're the ones that get picked off when things get bad, but actually it looks as if many, many of our villages that are still now caused, they're currently occupied by rural settlements, are doing just as badly in the aftermath of the Black Death, and of course that raises the question, why do some survive and some don't? Perton is clearly staggering on, probably doing very little better than these other sites that ended up being deserted around it. 
And we can, oh, I won't worry about that, this is a different sort of field system suggesting that maybe something to do with the agricultural base is causing the growth in the first place, and that possibly post-medieval land use and land type is what's causing uh, some villages to stay or to decline, and others to kind of recover. Panning out from that, though, um, we have had a couple of outliers, because what I want to inspire you about tonight is what is going to come <coughs> up in Reef, and what is that going to tell you and us. Um, and I think that's roughly where Reef is. A big circle. I've sort of got a reasonable large prayer on that. Um, <laughs> as you can see, we're mostly in East England. There are a couple of others. Um, and I'm just going to show you what's come out of those. Kibworth in Leicestershire, we did with Michael Wood in 2010. Um, it's actually four villages, Kibworth Harcourt, Kibworth Beecham, uh, Smeaton and Westerby. Um, 43 pits, again, there's the white uh, squares. This is the Roman map, uh, Roman pottery up here and down here. Two separate communities, I and mean, then again, it's the best part of two kilometres between those, so it's a sort of long Melford sort of size community. Um, into the early middle Anglo-Saxon period, well, the Roman settlements have no continuity, but there's certainly something going on at what is now the crossroads. This is the A6, if any of you know that road going up to Leicester, just up north of here. Um, into the Middle Saxon period, this early Saxon settlement seems to disappear, but there's something going on here. So we've got a very mobile, fluid landscape, but more pottery turning up than really nearly all of our Eastern English villages. So something a bit different perhaps going on in Central England. Into the uh, later Middle Anglo, or the late Anglo-Saxon period, we see Smeaton Westerby, or I think that's Smeaton there, the Smith's Tun. Uh, clearly coming into existence then, something up at Kibworth and something outlying here. Into the high medieval period, nice bit of activity here, there's obviously lots of gaps where we could really do the whole load more pits here. Um, and Smeaton and Westerby here, clearly thriving. And then of course we come to the 14th century again, that post 14th century. And so we're interested that this is central England, Leicestershire, this is the heartland of the deserted medieval village. What's going on here? And look at that. Virtually depopulated. If I just go back to that's before the Black Death, that's afterwards. I mean, look in particular down here. Absolutely, almost completely wiped out. Really, just a tiny little sort of straggle along one street. But of course, it picks up in the post medieval period and into the Victorian period. And the last one I'm going to look at is Castleton in Derbyshire, because this is the most northerly place we've had a go at. Um, was only, I think, about 20 pits dug. It might even be less than that, actually. We have two field academies here. Castleton should be a really thriving place. It has a castle, as you can tell by the name. Many of you will know Peveril Castle anyway. Um, it's even got the medieval town layout. You can see the town ditch there surviving as an earthwork, and it was one of those rectilinear planned towns. That's where the castle is underneath the caption there. Um, <laughs> But you can see it's a medieval planned town. Um, the earliest date for which we have anything from Castleton is the high medieval period, the mid 11th to the middle 14th century. And we have a couple of bits from there and a couple of bits from there and one or two stray pieces here. Interestingly, these are all outside the supposed line of the town. In fact, those are as well. And I do appreciate it's difficult to see on this, but there are test pits in the centre here which are not producing anything. So we've had very little medieval pottery at all from Castle. When you compare it with Purton, which admittedly has a Mont Bailey Castle, but it doesn't have anything like Peveril Castle in it, well, not now. Um, this is really bizarre. When Ken Smith from the um, Peak District National Park came out to visit, I asked him about this. I said, is this Ken, is this what you'd expect? from somewhere like Castleton. Because I was slightly well, confused, worried, you know, it, it seemed odd. And he said, to be quite honest, we have no idea. <laughs> You've heard this before. Um, <laughs> he said, what we really need is for this sort of work to be done with 20, 30, 40 pits in five or 10, even more villages in the surrounding area so that we can get a, a benchmark on what we'd expect. You know, we don't have that. Until you've got that, you've really no idea what's good, what's bad, what's mediocre, how one place compares to another. Um, into the 
Uh, nothing in late medieval pottery at all from Carseth. And if you remember the pottery that's been found so far, it appears to be completely deserted. It's not until we get into the post-medieval period. Um, and in fact, and you can see how suddenly the village, well, town appears to take off. This is nothing to do with the medieval history. This is when the turnpike road from, I think, Sheffield to Manchester goes straight through. And some <coughs> fortunes of the place are transformed and the system is working. Now, we don't know if people in Castleton are just not using much pottery or what, because we don't have those comparisons. Right. Um, again, what I just want to say is this is the same. Like this red line now is the eastern region trajectory that, you know, okay, in the Roman, bit of a downturn in the earlier Middle Anglo Saxon, picking up <coughs> increasingly higher growth to the 14th century, then a drop, then picking up. What's interesting here, we've got Kibworth in Leicestershire in blue and Castleton in green. What is interesting from this is the difference. Kibworth seems to be much more severely hit compared to the eastern region average, but the trajectory afterwards is much, much faster. The growth, its line is much more closer to vertical. It's growing much more in the post-medieval period, as is Castleton. Look at that, Castleton and Kibworth, that trajectory is almost exactly the same. And of course, for me looking at this, I think, well, what's Reef going to do then? How is it going to compare on that sort of map? And if you can, and I would urge you to try and get 20 or 30 pits dug, at least because you can see that the more you get, the more you can rely on that data that's coming up. And I would also want to reassure you, when you look at that map of Purton, with its 104, now 110 pits, you would think, I must make a note of this village, because should anyone I know ever be considering buying a house there, I would need to advise them against it, as the place is completely, completely undermined and will completely collapse. Any house will just subside away to nothing, um, as it's clearly going to be looking like Swiss cheese underneath there. But what's worth thinking about is the size of these pits. They are just a metre square. And 100 pits, if shown to scale, and the reason I show them largely so you can see them, if you show them to scale, that's those 100 pits shown at scale. Those 100 pits are a 10 metre by 10 metre trench. It would fit inside this room. So the test fitting is fantastically dynamic, exciting, doable exercise. I haven't said anything about how fun it is. Uh, we collect feedback from communities who are involved. And it's fantastically good. It's a great way to get other members of your family involved. If you think the best of your digging days may be behind you, get some younger family members to come over for the weekend and do something a bit different. Um, it's a great way for different generations, friends, families, neighbours to get together. Something like a barbecue at lunchtime if you're doing test bit digging over a weekend. Uh, I would highly recommend that uh, part of the SWAG uh, budget from the HLF, and I'm sure the HLF will support this, is at the end of the weekend digging, have a get-together with tea and cakes. Nothing goes with archaeology better than cakes. Um, make it fun. There is, and, and the great thing is if you've spent two days digging a test, but you can have that slice of cake without a trace of guilt because you've really, really earned it. And as you can see, it will produce the most fantastic information. You will, really will find a new history of reef from the digging. So I wish the project all the very, very, very best of luck. Um, I am really interested to see what the results are going to be. We've got a few other communities in the north starting to take interest. So I'm hoping we'll be able to sort of um, uh, aggregate the information and see how it all goes. But for you, I wish you all the very, very best of luck. I really look forward to seeing how the results are and how they come out and what you'll be able to tell me about Reef the next time I'm up here. So thank you very much for your time. I'm very happy to take questions, but thank you for listening. Whilst questions might perhaps be fresh in your minds, if, if there are any questions you would like to put to Grenza, please do before uh, I wind up in a minute.